Last week I talked about the need to sustain spiritual momentum. So the first thing that for, for momentum to happen it has to be something new. Remember? It has to be something new. New automatically triggers momentum. Something new. Doing something new triggers momentum. We get stuck in a rut because we're doing the same old thing the same old way. New triggers momentum. We've got to think about our lives right now. What can we do? What kind of shift can we make to trigger momentum? It can happen in a job, a relationship, in yourself. With whatever you are, you're stagnant sometimes because momentum is needed to move you on and move you forward. The Jordan River flows into the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee flows into the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea because of a lack of momentum. That means it has an inlet, but no outlet. When things are coming in, but things are not moving out, that means you're going to have stagnancy. And whenever things are stagnant, you cannot produce anything in a stagnant atmosphere. When you are stagnant, when there's a lack of momentum in your life, you will not be productive because you are stagnant. You need momentum. Something needs to jumpstart you and get you moving in some direction. And that begins with something new. We talked to our men's group that new relationships create momentum because it's new. But that goes to the second principle of momentum has to be improved. Right. New doesn't mean necessarily better, does it? New just means new, especially if you haven't done and maximized the use of the old. You just got a new. You've got the iPhone 5S, but you never learned how to use the 5. But you enjoy the new features of the 5S that you don't use and will never use because you have to have something new. But new doesn't mean improved unless you're able to activate momentum. Make use of how you're going to use what is new. So new is number one. Number two has to be improved. Number three, improving. Everything has a shelf life. Even though you have something that's working right now, it will not work forever. It has to be improving. Somebody say improving. In order for it to be continually improving, you have to continue to evaluate. Why do we keep doing this? Same thing, the same way. In order for things to improve and continue to improve, you have to evaluate. A systematic way of evaluating. Nothing is off limits. That means feelings are going to be hurt because we get stuck in doing things the way that we like to do them. In order for momentum to happen, you've got to challenge yourself. Why do you stay on the same diet? Why do you do the same thing? Do not exercise. Why do you go to the same places? In order for that to happen, you have to have new friends, new atmosphere, new methods, new ways of doing things. Don't do the same way. Find a new way of doing it. Find an improved way of doing it. New atmosphere, a new look, new appearance. And remember, new is not simply tweaking the old. Remember, you don't just change the color of something and say it's new. Or just move things around and say it's new. Momentum happens when it's, when it's a market improved over what was before. So I challenge you again, find a way to spark momentum. I challenge you to do something new. The scripture today comes from Acts chapter 27, verse 21 through verse number 26. But after long absence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart. From there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told to me. However, we must run around on a certain island. Paul was a prisoner being taken before Caesar in Rome. And the ship captain was warned not to sail during this time. It was a turbulent season. But he was greedy, and arrogant, and stubborn. And he cared more about cargo and profit than real prophecies that had been given to him. So even though he was on this ship, God was still in control. I also know in every storm, in every tribulation, God is in control. Storms are not in control. God is in control. And my proof of this is down south, we lived in old shacks. And no, and all, everything was above, on blocks, houses on blocks. And big storms would come. And storms that would normally destroy these shacks 
But over hundreds of years, these shacks are still standing. Why are that? Because inside those shacks, somebody's praying. <laughs> God, I know that this storm is not in control. And when it's all over, the shack still remains. Because even though it's on blocks, the people are on a foundation. You see, it's the foundation that you're on that allows whatever you're in to stand. Amen? It's not what your home rests upon. It's the foundation that you rest upon. He who builds his house upon a rock is wise. But one who builds his house on sand is a fool. And in this construction, in this passage, it talks about the same house. They didn't talk about how the house was built or the construction or design of the house. It talked about the foundation. And we can so often get caught up into trying to build something. And we don't look at the foundation of which it rests upon. And the foundation determines the structure's integrity and how it will endure. So build on that right foundation. Ships are safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. God has a plan, and I prayed, I know you have prayed to God, show me the plan. And what we really are praying for is we want to be able to approve God's plan. But God's plan is good. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us hope and a wonderful future. So if we believe God, we believe that all things, even this is working together for what? For good. So whatever is there is in God's plan. It's working. We want God to bring us something new. And God brings us something new. And we want God to bring us something else to new. And God brings something else new. And it's, it's just God bring me something else new. And God says, you're tripping. Because it's not a new thing that we need sometimes. It's a better use a better understanding, a better way of dealing with what God's already given us. The old sometimes is working. It just wasn't working the way we wanted to work. Or it's not working in our time frame. And what's missing sometimes is the opportunity for us to let God be in the midst of everything. So it works not our way, but it works ultimately God's way. It says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. Even in my own life, I, I've struggled with, is this the call that God has for me? And I think any pastor, no matter what you're doing, and you're doing it for God, you're going to reach that point where you ask yourself, am I the person, God, I'm certainly you can find somebody better than me to do this. I look at other pastors on, who preach, and I'm thinking, that, that's preaching. That's preaching. But I've found that God uses the gift that he gives you to do what God wants you to do. Don't try to be another somebody else. Be the best you that God's called you to be. Amen? We want to, prog we want to do what that church is doing. We want, we want to happen what's happening over here. You're blessed. I want to be blessed like you are. Rather than letting God just feed you where he finds you, build you up, equip you, in business, I, I, as a chiropractor, very successful business. Things looked well there. As an athlete, did very well there. Because what I did was I just pushed myself hard. I knew how to work long hours. I knew how to give my all. I knew how to get those right people around me and how to maximize the use of my resources. But when it comes to God, it's a whole different principle. King Zerubbabel was trying to build the temple. To temple. It got to a certain point and, and everything just ceased. And he was frustrated because it wasn't happening. Everything had just ceased. And then the word of God came to him. He says, Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. You see, all of my effort and all of my strength couldn't get me what God wants me to be in the kingdom. That's the world principle. But in God's principle, it's in God's time frame. Be not weary in well-doing, and like a tree planted by the rivers of water, he shall bring forth his fruit in its season. Not your season, but God's season. And God has a season for you, but we have to not become weary. Not try and move ourselves because we're not seeing what we want to see in our time frame. In those burnout moments, when I begin to doubt myself and whether this is what, I need to, what I'm meant to do, 
That's when that still voice comes to me. I've called you. I know you by your name. I know that God knows you personally. He hears your prayers. He, he hears your cries. He sees you. He knows you. And wherever you are, God has his hand upon you. Trust in God makes your faith visible. First Peter 4 and 16 says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Let him glorify God. Trusting God makes your faith visible. First Timothy 3 and 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. You know, the bed can be a very warm and safe place on Sunday morning, can it? It can be. There's nothing like Sunday morning sleep. You, you know, Saturday morning, you got to get up. There's so many things to do with Sunday morning. It's just nice. When that's where you need momentum. You need to get up. You need to force yourself to get up on Sunday morning. If you have a voice, use it. Use it. God wants to hear your voice. If you have a song, sing it. If you have a prayer, then pray it. Whatever God has for you, God intends for you to use that for his glory. And to do that, we've got to force ourselves to move into the position that God wants us to move into. Trusting God makes your faith visible. When somebody has a need, how do we show God to them? We have to fulfill that need. I don't know them, God. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were out there, while we were lost in sin, Christ died for us. Making the invisible visible. Sometimes the only way a person would come to know God is by watching people who know God. And If you know him and you exemplify him and you live the life that he would have you to live, people learn who he is through you. We're the hands, the voice. We're the feet of God. And people learn who he is through us. Paul was the most valuable person on that ship. He knew how to pray. And when Paul began to pray, God began to answer prayers. Not just for Paul, but for every person that was on the ship. When you learn how to just pray and really believe God, God changes not just you, but people around you are changed. Your workplace is changed. Your friends are changed. By simply allowing God to have an impact on your life. There was a guy who came to Bible college, Moody Bible College. It was a school for women at, at first. And he arrived at the railroad depot, railway depot. And there was a man in a horse and carriage. And he thought this man was a cabbie. He said, I need to go to the hotel. The guy says, well, I'm waiting for some students right now. And then he insisted, I need you to take him to the hotel. So the guy got into the, let him get into the, the, uh, the carriage there, took him to the hotel. And he was surprised that the guy didn't charge him anything. The other surprise is that was D.L. Moody, the president of the college. Sometimes we got to learn how to be the servant. Amen? CEO, but to God, we're just O. Nobody has authority in the kingdom. Everybody's on the same playing field. Pastor by day, doorkeeper by night. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God, right? Than dwell in the tents of wickedness. God's not looking at how high you can be, but how humble you can be. It's humility that moves God. It's not your position, not your accomplishments. You won't be able to take a resume into heaven. God won't look at that and say, I'll let you in. Oh, look at this. You had all this? You've been busy. All of your real estate will be left behind. Everything you've got, everything that you came with will be left. You came with nothing and you'll leave with nothing. So the purpose of us being here is to live out our salvation, to live out what Christ would do if he had been here. We're the hands and feet. That means if Jesus Christ died for us, then we're meant to live for him. So what would Jesus do in your situation? When you're placed in a situation, don't ask, what do I, what I want to do? What would Jesus do? When you see that person on the street, what would Jesus do? That person is outside the grocery store. It taps on your window. Can you spare some loose change? What would Jesus do? Oh, you're going to just probably going to buy beer. What would Jesus do? 
Because we can't judge, right? An angel, the Bible says, sometimes we can unknowingly entertain angels unawares. That's Romans 13 and 1. Do not forget to entertain strangers, Romans 13 and 1. Because sometimes you'll entertain angels unawares. If it's not Romans 13 and 1, look at Hebrews 13 and 1. <laughs> but do not forget to entertain angels because sometimes, entertain strangers because sometimes you entertain angels unawares. That angel can appear to be offensive, can appear to, appear to be everything that you would think, but you cannot judge, right? Do not judge. In the same way that you judge, the Bible says you also will be judged. Number three, storms have a way of revealing character. And they agreed with him. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed in the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple, in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And here are these apostles, rather than talk about how wrong it was, saw how right it was. That anyone who is in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It comes with being a Christian. It comes with being a child of God. And when they left out, they left out saying, wasn't that, wasn't that awesome? We got beat. Man, high five each other. We got beat. Why? For the cause of Christ. Because there's some things that's worth living for, but there's other things that's worth dying for. Dr. Martin Luther King says, any person who's not found a cause worth dying for is not fit to live. Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live, I live for him. If I die, I get to see him. So whether I live or die, my life is all for Jesus Christ. It's not that I'm living so that I can live for me. You don't want to get to heaven and see that your living has been in vain. That all that you have done, everything that you've accomplished does not matter in the kingdom. The Bible says not store up your treasure here. Not at B of A, a compass or Wells Fargo, but store up your treasure where? In glory. That means that when you're doing what Jesus would have you to do, when you're living out your salvation, you're storing up your treasure. And some of you, I say, need to store up some treasure this week. Your account is running a little bit low. You've got to find a way some week, some way this week to store up some treasure in heaven. Find the need and fill it. Make a difference in somebody's life. Try in some way to extend your hand and your heart to serve somebody. If I could help somebody as I pass along this way, that my living is not in vain. If I live, I don't want to live so that I can just be remembered for the things that I did down here. But I want to be remembered for the things that I did for the kingdom. Because that's where the real tally is being kept. Not all the things you did so that you got something back. I helped people so that they could help me. I gave so that I could receive interest on what I was given. But find a way that you can give. As the Bible says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. When you're able to give secretly, when you're able to do and not expect anything in return, the Bible says now, the one who gives secretly, God rewards openly. God loves it when we do things in secret. When we try to take no recognition, no glory for it. And the truth is we can't beat God giving. Is that right? Everything that we've got, God gave us. Ships are safe in harbor. It's safe to not want to get involved. We came out yesterday. We started to talk about purposes. Oh, a beautiful group. We had a wonderful time. We shared the future of what God sees in our church. And we learned why we fellowship. What it means to be a disciple. Why do we worship? When we have the opportunity and the privilege to sing songs and give praise to God in here, why do we raise our hands? You see, you don't do it just because they say stand up and lift your hands. You do it because you know that it's a privilege to be in the presence of the living God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's a privilege 
The Bible says that everything that has breath, just praise him. It's safe to just stay in your seat. I just don't feel like lifting my hands. I don't feel like standing up right now. I'm just not in the mood. When you think about how good God is and what he's done for you this week. I promise if you if you started just counting your blessings. Just one by one, just start counting your blessing. And think about what he's done, the food on your table. And how God's woke you up every morning and health and life. Then something was up in your spirit that says, I feel like praising, praising him. There has to be a reason. Something has to make you know that God is good. Not just sometime, but God is good all the time. When you think about that, you feel like praising him. When you look at your children and how blessed you are, you think about the ones that have gone before you and how far God has brought us, we feel like praising him. And as the song says, you have to turn to your neighbor and says, if you don't feel like praising, don't hinder me.